It's Thursday, July 4th. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. Today's show is about families, the cost of living, and what it takes to afford it. Joining me for the conversation, I've got folks who've got a lot to say, experts around food insecurity and all the discussions and layers around it. So don't go anywhere. We're going to talk some solutions, too. So my guest today, guests, plural, <laughs> are experts on food insecurity, experts around poverty, experts around the communities, their communities, and the discussions around all of this when it comes to the cost of living, right? Their experiences lived and or living, right? So the past tense and or uh, the present. They're all with Food First and L's lived and or living experience uh, advisory group, uh, short for it, LEAG, L-L-E-A-G. Here's our question for you. As you listen through the show, I'll say this a few times through the show, too. How is the high cost of living impacting you and your family in Newfoundland and Labrador, right? What's it like? As you're listening to us, if uh, you have thoughts, email us, the signal at cbc.ca, or you can call the signal line and leave a message, 709-576-5260. And you can also text us, 709-327-8206. So I'll repeat that a little bit through the show, but uh, here goes the panel discussion. So we've got, uh, here are the three members of the group. So we've got uh, Kayla Dillon, who's uh, here in the studio. How you doing? Hi, great. Uh, tell us where you came in from, because you, you drove in, right? Yeah, <laughs> so I came in from uh, Lethbridge. Yeah. So I came in on Monday to avoid the, the big rain. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah, you avoided it, then oh, you watched yeah. it. Then I watched it and uh, had to transport around St. John's in it for a little bit. And <laughs> when I come out, I, I make it like I fill the, the time with errands. But mm. I don't get out as often as I'd like to. <laughs> Yo, and a blo- yeah. block full. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we have uh, Sada Uzman here. Uh, you did not drive in from Lethbridge. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I drove in from Airport Heights. Oh, Airport Heights. Yeah. All right. Uh, and Haley Poudin is back. Hi, Haley. How are you doing? Hello, I'm good. And you, you're dri- where'd you drive in from? You to tell, remind folks. I come from Carboneer, That's but right. I also spend time in Pooch Cove, and I drive in and out from town. Here we go. All right. And in, uh, you know, uh, in St. John's, I, I think uh, I was speaking, we're going to hear from someone, uh, from Amanda Canning, who's part of the group uh, in Deer Lake. I spoke with her this morning. Overcast at Deer Lake, but uh, sunny in around St. John's Metro. Let's start with, well, the cost of living, right? This is what we're here to talk about. Uh, this, it's a big part of what League is all about. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit more on League in, in just a bit. But thoughts on where we are right now with the cost of living and and for for families. Uh, Sada, I'll start with you. Yes. So I've only been here two years and a few months. And uh, I can feel the crunch, right? The money I would usually, like, take to the grocery store two years ago doesn't buy me as much today. It's only been two years. Yeah, because typically that might be like a, oh, I remember arriving 10 years ago, and now it's so different. But two years, I mean, that's not a lot of time. Yes, it's a very short time, short amount of time. So you can imagine what's happening, what has happened, like, in the time frame of 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's only two years, and I'm feeling it so very much. Yeah. What what do you think that for, for a newcomer experience to hear, what does that say to folks who are coming in and trying to set up homes and, and, and put down roots and stuff? Yeah, it's a lot difficult. It's a lot more difficult for newcomers because we have all the challenges already in place. You, This is, um, for us now, like moving here, we didn't have credit record. Yeah. Like we don't, we didn't live in North America. So our credit record kind of sort of doesn't matter. So we have to start afresh. So you already do not have access to like the financials yeah. in the first place. We wanted to own a home. We couldn't. So we have to rent, and rent is a lot, like, it's a lot more than owning a home. So this is them saying, no, you're not good enough for a home. But then you're paying a lot more on a monthly for, yeah, yes. So newcomers have all of that. And no matter how financially stable you are, being a newcomer in Canada, there's all of this rosiness from the outside, like, oh, come to Canada, it's all good. It's oh, yeah. all, yes. <laughs> it's, no, when you come here... The cost of living, the child care, there's no child care. It's, uh, I've been on the wait list for two years and I only got my daughter into uh, um, preschool. Yeah. And now I just started working. 
So I have been here two years. Now think about someone who's been here, who came here as a family, and there's only one parent working in that home. Right. I, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough, especially if the, the wage bracket is like if you're on a lower wage bracket. It's, uh, it's really very tough. It's like there's uh, there, so there's what folks hear about Canada, right? Mm-hmm. And and this reputation internationally, I've heard it for in other countries I've lived in or traveled in, right? Mm-hmm. But then it's like kind of what you're saying. There's like a fine print for if you're moving here that uh, that that is not always uh, maybe it's on the back of the jar of Canada as opposed to uh, right there under the, the the title. Oh yeah, I think it should come with a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what you what you hear is not what you get, so it's uh, it's very different. Yeah. <laughs> Kayla, what about yourself? Cost of living. So I, uh, I, I'm from St. John's originally. Yeah. So like, uh, I had a lot of barriers, like just in, in like the 15 years that my oldest son has been with me. But uh, the real like the real barrier I found once I moved to Lethbridge and you know started my family, it was completely different. So I'm watching now. Like, not only am I watching. You know, the access of getting to places and seeing everybody else, you know, it's it's the pricing. I'm going into these grocery stores and I go in the, these grocery stores with the most anxiety. And then when I get to the checkout, I'm I'm so anxious to see that final number because it seems like the things I bought six months ago are almost double in price or the things I bought, you know, and it's just it's absolute madness because. I know that I'm not the only one going into a grocery store with anxiety, wondering mm. like, what am I mm. going to do today? You know, what am I going to put back today? You know, and and I think that's the biggest crutch, especially now with the summer. Now that my kids are out from school, it's that much more difficult because I'm trying to keep them fed all day. <laughs> you know, and they could like like my 15 year old could literally eat me out of the house. Like mm. he, he's he's got the two stomachs i'm sure of it (laughs) right so yeah the biggest thing i find now more than ever is is just going into that grocery store just getting in there in the first place is so it makes me so anxious you know and then getting in there and then you're going around and you want to get something and you're like yeah my kids like this but now all of a sudden instead of 5.99 on a bag of apples it's it's 10.99 on a bag of apples or it's you know you can get this one but most of it will be moldy so it's fine you know because you'll get it for half price you know it's 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 a lot of um stress internally and then you get in there and you go oh i gotta put this back this time yeah. Right. Can't get this. Can't get that. And it's not me. It's it's so many people. I hear from so many people that are it's the same conversation. Yeah. Like, how am I doing that? How am I going to do this? These groceries. But then also put, you know, heat in my home. How mm. am I going to pay my rent and afford even a couple of apples, you know, or something? And and it's it's heart wrenching yeah. to hear like you experience it yourself. But then when you're hearing other people struggling it, sometimes more so it, it's it's heartbreaking yeah you don't want to see anybody hungry you don't want to see anybody cold you don't want to see your your community and your your neighbors like that right and it's a lot <laughs> yeah no, it, it's a lot it yeah it's a lot yeah right? yeah looking around yeah. wondering how folks were forwarding to yeah. live yeah you know and then you're right like the sale or like i i oh. typically like the sale, some of the sale racks i call it the mush rack right yeah you're, you're, you're reaching yeah. in and seeing what is not mush yeah and what you can buy there's a couple of apps you can get now for different like um restaurants and and grocery stores and i frequent those pretty regularly especially you can get like these produce boxes hmm. and i and i mean like you can get these produce boxes for five dollars they're like right before their shelf life ends so I, I i find i bring them like i even when i come to st john's i i look through all of the like the stores and i went home with a couple of boxes at my my mother's house and so we go through it but then you're throwing out like you're grabbing like a tomato but then the next tomato is like moldy and furry and and dripping and then it's yeah. so Ugh. you're getting yes you're getting a deal but it's like you have to like kind of process your food appropriately if you want it to maintain it because it's already past its life. Mm. But that's how we do produce in my place. It's it's like how can I get cheaper produce? It's the mush aisle. It's the yeah. mush it's the mush bins, right? Yeah. yeah. And of course, yeah. right? Because it's there, it's <laughs> yeah. it's such a lower price and then yeah. you just kinda of pick it through just to see what's yeah. available. Right? But you need to make sure that you use it. <laughs> that's the problem. Right, right? away. Right, right away. Like, like do not like I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Do not do it tomorrow. Because <laughs> it's it's gone. Tomorrow now. it's furry. <laughs> so <laughs> Haley, what about yourself? Ah, for me and affordability, it's kind of the perspective of living in Ontario and having lots of access to like food banks and having access to 
more stores and more deals and more competition for those prices and even, you know, reduced items. And then moving here, um, I've been moved here in 2019. So initially I thought maybe it was like the pandemic and that whole culture that made things different. But as we've now come out of that, I started to notice that no middle income people are now at the food bank. No middle income people are now like shoulder to shoulder fighting for reduced stickers at the grocery stores. So it just kind of made me think like, wow, what really happened? And I know it's not just in Newfoundland, it's across Canada. And going back to um, the perspective of newcomers, like I was born abroad and I came here when I was five. Mm. So to grow up in like the 80s economy where everything was very tight, um, it was hard for my colored father to find a job. We were with one income with my Caucasian Canadian mother. So it's kind of like, I'm seeing the same kind of political pulse and like that economic pulse as I did like 20, 30 years ago. And for me, that's scary because newcomers are coming here thinking, you know, it's it's going to be great. And yes, there's positives, but no one talks about you have to choose heating or food. No one talks about your children will probably have to suffer before you gain and you will have to suffer mental health before you gain. So the affordability is really not just about the material gain or the lack thereof, there's a lot of health and mental health consequences to this affordability crisis for everybody from any income bracket. Absolutely. As folks are listening to the three of you, I think they can already understand why you would want to get involved with Food First and L and uh, you know, lived and or living experience advisory group, right? But uh, I will still ask the question to you because uh, uh, it's important to to fully understand and, and you know, we can, uh, Haley, let's start with you on that one. Like, what, why did you want to get involved with League? I want to get involved with League because I found it hard for me to find employment in Newfoundland for some reason, and also found it hard for me to get volunteer um, experience. And I know, again, part of it was influenced because of the pandemic, poor timing on my part, and then Snowmageddon. But it was just an opportunity for me to get my foot out there, to get my name out there, because coming from Ontario, I have lots of um, uh, academic credentials. I have lots of volunteer experience. Like, I want to help. I want to join. I want to contribute. And it was just like I was stonewalled. So pretty much applying to league was like, it's this or nothing. Like yeah. that was my mental health at the time, all or nothing. And I got the interview and I was shocked that I was chosen. And I've been so grateful ever since because I've met lovely people. I've had lots of networking. I've had lots of opportunities to voice my opinion or my experience, as well as trying to advocate for those who need to remain anonymous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I love I love this. So I uh, I lucked into just kind of stumbling upon it um, <clears throat> at my post office, and uh, I have always kind of been that mindset of like, how can I help others? And yeah. like, uh, like Haley mentioned about you know the mental health side of it. For me, it was a lot of over the years uh, dealing with my own mental health issues as well, and and always wanting to leave people better than than I found them. So I always look for ways to do it. So when I stumbled upon the the posting for League, I couldn't like I couldn't jump on it any faster because hmm. I'm I'm watching it, I'm living it. Like I was a single mom, you know, on my own with my son, and I lived that in St. John's, you know, when I had those experiences, and and um, and then moving, you know, uprooting my whole entire life and moving to Lethbridge to start a family and all of a sudden I go from single mom of one to to four four children in this, our big household and uh, seeing the whole new ball game and watching again watching going through the pandemic completely isolated from everything I was used to and and then going into it not knowing anyone because I had moved um, in 2018 to Lethbridge so once my son came I was you know new mom for a year and then my daughter came a year later and then COVID came a month later or well, I had my daughter in the midst of new COVID right at the mm. beginning. Yeah. So I was so isolated and I was so like league. The opportunity for league was an opportunity for me to to connect and to be able to connect in, in my passion of helping in some way. And I couldn't have thought of a better opportunity th- than food insecurity because it's so real and and the anxiety is so growing and, and it's it's, it's I, I keep saying it but it's so many people and it's it's mind numbing because you could walk down someone the street and see someone and go like yeah they got it all together but like they might not have eaten in days or they've eaten very minimal and it's it's just the passion is like it just lit a fire underneath me and then to get to like not officially meet like I'm only meeting these ladies today for the first time oh, wow. yeah so <laughs> getting to meet people but even just virtually the connection that we've all 
been building together is is amazing and like i just i feel so humbled to yeah. have my own experience but to to hear from these these people around me and, and the league has just been amazing it's mm. i i just i'm so excited to see how far we get with this because we're ready yeah. we're so ready <laughs> Well, and you're, well yeah. you know, you're, there's there's advocacy, there's doing stuff like this coming on the media, oh, yeah. Yeah. and and also like I'm hearing like the peer to peer support too. Right? Oh, big time. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Sada, what about yourself? Yes, for me, it's a 100 percent a case of nothing about us without us. Yeah. <laughs> you have policies being made by people who have no idea. Yeah. You know, they just think we know what's right for you. It's not like coming in and saying, "How can we help?" Yeah. That's what everybody needs to hear. I'm here. How can I help you? So I feel I bring, um, I am with me, uh, I bring with me like a, the voice of so many people, the voice of the newcomer, the voice of a migrant woman, the voice of a, a cultural woman, the voice of a mother, the voice of you know, a sister, a wife, someone who is in a new place without family support. And I feel I bring all of those voices and I can speak to that and I, I can speak for my community, I can speak for my people and I bring those voices to league. And these policies are made not only for Canadians who have been here for a while, because it, at the end of the day, it, it affects everyone. Yeah. So I feel like I bring that voice. I bring the voices of those people that are naturally in things like this, like we don't have newcomers don't really very much get involved because in league, I'm practically the only newcomer. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So I'm like, yeah. yes, I represent a certain demographic and I am here to speak for it. And these policies are going to affect us. So, yes, I'm here as the voice of the newcomer and all the other <laughs> groups. It's a lot of responsibility in a way, right? It is. I mean, someone has to take the responsibility. Yeah. Someone, like, the plight of the newcomers is not, like, you hardly hear about it. Yeah. So we have, like, so many challenges being newcomers, and especially if you have, if there's poverty involved with food insecurity. So there's the issue of culture. Right. The, recently, I hosted a multicultural food festival with my, my child's school, uh, Roncalli Elementary School. And the vice principal told me, she, she gave me a story about this new kid who came in, and I think they had no food or something. So they handed the kid a granola bar. Mm -hmm. And she said the first day, he was just looking at it like, what is this? Yeah. And he peeled it open, and he made crumbs out of it. He couldn't handle like he couldn't just ingest it. Yeah. Because that is culturally inappropriate. He doesn't know that. He doesn't see a granola bar as food. No. So he went the day, like, they had to just look around and find something that he could eat. So that's not food. As far as he's concerned, that's just, it's just something. It's not food. Hmm. So, and she mentioned after, like, about a week or so of trying granola bar, he finally did, like, swallow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> swallow a bite. So, yes. So there's that those challenges. And in food banks, you can see people get handed over... Um, peanut butter, or some canned food. And in my culture, canned food is not food. Yeah, Whole food is food, yeah. right? We want food. So those are things that those policies need to change. It's not about the cheapest. It's not about feeding the, 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 the beast of, you know, what would I say, the, the profit, like those mm -hmm. people that made profit. You, it's just about feeding them. Okay, someone's producing canned beans. Someone has to eat them. How about we just dump them in the food bank? Yeah. So we want real food. We want food that people want. People can can like uh, eat, and people can find nourishment from. Not just anything, because we want to. Because we have a contract with someone, and we have to take what they offer. Mm -hmm. Well, and if yeah. something's not culturally appropriate, then there, like you said, if 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 a child doesn't even identify, re look at something as it being food, then that there's no point. Like that's not nothing was achieved. Exactly. And the, the food banks, we have um, a lot of cases that uh, people just collect food from the food bank because you do not have an option. Yeah. You don't go in, there's no, right. it's, it's a messed up system. I mean, the people there, respect for them, they're doing really, but they're doing very good with the little resources that they have. Yeah. But then you hand over a bag of grocery, it's nothing to someone because by the time they open it, there's nothing there for them. Mm. So if we have a system where people can walk in with dignity and pick out the food that they can eat, not just take home whatever, and then at the end of the day, it's just wasted. Yeah. So we talk about food insecurity, and we know for a fact that it's not like the world is not producing enough food. No, the problem is distribution. Mm -hmm. 
the, the oh, food there's, goes there's enough food in this province, right? Go to the grocery stores. There's enough food for everyone in New Flannel Labrador. For, I know, mm-hmm. yes, there's a food security conversation to be had about growing our own and shoring up the systems and everything else. Of course. But... There's enough food in this province for everyone in it for what gets brought in. Exactly. Yeah. And everywhere around the world is the same because yeah. we all have this produce section. We have yeah. the grocery stores. You go to the produce section, there is more than enough produce for everyone. Yet some people still go to bed hungry. I mean, how do we even yeah. begin to justify that? And this is what comes down to policy choices, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, choices of, of how much is there for social assistance? What are the emergency food systems? Does the food and, – and I know, like, as we talk about uh, Food First and L, there there is – a project that they've been doing around reimagining these food emergency food mm-hmm. systems. These conversations are ongoing. We've done shows on them before. We're going to be doing more shows on them, but we're still today talking about the reality mm-hmm. of what folks are experiencing. You are listening to The Signal. I'm Adam Walsh, and uh, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about the cost of living. I've got uh, folks from a uh, lived and or living experience advisory panel with me with, with Food First and Health here in the studio. Here's where you come into this today. As you're listening, how is the high cost of living impacting you and your family? Send us an email, the signal at cbc.ca. You can text us, 709-327-8206, or you can call the signal line and leave a message, 709-576-5260. The members on that panel with me in studio, we've got Kayla Dillon here, Sada Usma, and Haley Puna. On the phone, we've got Elizabeth Saunders, who is in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you doing? Good. How are you today? Good. You know, hanging out, chatting with uh, with your colleagues here uh, in St. John's. How are things uh, looking in Goose Bay? Um, well, actually, right now I'm over at my cabin, and I oh. had to come out to <laughs> out to the opening where I could actually get cell service. So I'm well, thank just you for that. <laughs> watching the water and having the mosquitoes flying around my head. There you go. Uh, we'll be careful. Be careful with the mosquitoes. Tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, well, I was a single mom for 13 years, and my son is now 17. Um, I moved back to Labrador from British Columbia because I needed support, both financially, mentally, physically, because I was a new mom. Um, So I moved home with my parents, and they had actually sold our house in Goose Bay, and we're living in Mud Lake. So the first year of his life, we lived in Mud Lake with no running water, and you had to get in boat to go across the Goose Bay and get your groceries and to get the water and to do laundry. So then I moved up to Goose Bay and thankfully found an apartment that I could afford. My it was a three bedroom apartment, four seventy five rent per month. And as the years have progressed, my rent went from four seventy five to six hundred. And then I moved into another apartment and my rent doubled. It went up to twelve hundred dollars a month. Hmm. <laughs> so <clears throat> Thankfully, I had a wonderful job, but then the cost of living increased. So just recently, I found a new job that I get a little bit more money. I work more hours, and I also have a second job just to support all of us and to make sure we have food. Wow. So better, you had to get a better a job that paid more plus a second job, and this is what yeah. you're doing in order to, to meet and, and the, the, the day-to-day cost of living of the reality of where we are now. Absolutely. And, <laughs> no, so I, in Goose Bay, we have three grocery stores. We have, am I allowed to name them? I, I mean, you could just say, you got, we, I think folks know, you got three grocery stores, and what about them? Yeah. Um, so one grocery store... I don't go to because I find it very expensive. Uh, another store we're a member of, so each year you get a rebate back, so that's where I try to spend the majority of my money. And then the third grocery store is where I go to buy my produce because that's the cheapest place to buy produce. Hmm. Yeah, so, so. Like, not a lot of choice, obviously, with only three. Uh, one you're a member Correct. of, the other you, you mentioned it's too expensive, then you go to one for your, for your produce. And this, yeah. so this is the day-to-day for that. What do you think folks don't realize for uh, people who are living, whether it's Happy Valley Goose Bay or it could be uh, rural parts of Labrador, like just the the northern experience for when it comes to food insecurity? Well, I mean, our produce, like our food that comes in, tends to not be the best quality. Um, Once upon a time, we used to be able to go hunt caribou and you could go fish. And so, I mean, people survived off the land. However, because the red wine caribou herd has decreased so drastically 
caribou is no longer a substance in your diet. Like, that's non-existent anymore. And, I mean, that was basically a free meat that would last the winter. Yeah. And now that's no longer an option. However, now we've started to be able to hunt moose and stuff. So that kind of balanced it out. But the traditional food is gone. Yeah, the country food, the traditional food, and then also, as we've already been talking about uh, in this hour, you know, the culturally appropriate and necessary food uh, mm-hmm. for, for like Indigenous folks and, and groups in this province. Uh, if it's not available, that has many layers of impact from, obviously, food insecurity and also that there's, there's some, you know, a mental health conversation there to be had too, right? Absolutely. Why did you get involved? And- oh, go, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say it, but thankfully we have a few local farmers in town who are, excuse me, who are um, trying their best and are finding different foods that can grow in our beautiful climate that we have. Because we do have four seasons in Goose Bay and in most of Labrador, which is wonderful. Unlike you folks on the island who have rangers, one fog. No, range is one thought. Yeah. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, we have sun here, so, but our growing season is so short. Mm. Yeah. And I got involved with League because I thought it was a wonderful idea on how to support everybody and to get rid of the stigma of if you need to go to the food bank, then you shouldn't be shunned for it. You shouldn't feel embarrassed. And I'm saying this because when I lived in British Columbia, I went to the food bank and I called my mother in tears and I was like, oh my God, mom, I felt like an absolute leech on the system. Like I should have my stuff together. I, and I just felt like I was so in a, such a bad place. And my mom, who is an amazing lady, just said to me, she said, Elizabeth, she said, when you can afford to, she said, pay it back. She said, you shouldn't feel bad for needing help. But when you can, just pay it back. So my mom is like my 100% support, and she's awesome. (laughs) So it's partially because of her. Mm. Well, I mean, I think that's a great message too, right? A, there's no shame, and we're talking about... uh from stigma to destigmatizing, right? And and right. and then, yeah, like if you get down the road and you can pay it back, great. But there's a reason why we've got certain safety systems that are supposed to be set up, and we're talking about improving them for folks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to let you get in out of the flies, and I just want to say thanks for finding a nice <laughs> spot with your cell phone there, Elizabeth, uh, for, for coming on the signal. Not a problem. Thank you, everybody. And hi, Kayla. I'm so glad I got to run into you in Walmart when we were in Clarenville. Yes, I'm so glad. I'm glad you called in. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful day and that everybody has enough food in their bellies to eat and are nourished. And we just get over the whole stigma of, and I wish government would just make things more affordable and give more money where we need more money. Excellent. Thank you again, Elizabeth. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Thank you. Elizabeth Saunders there at an undisclosed location somewhere outside of uh, (laughs) Happy Valley Goose Bay uh, in and around some mosquitoes. Any thoughts uh, here in studio from what Elizabeth was saying? Yeah, I I thought she touched on a great point um, with the shame, shame of going to food banks. I think that that is, and I can only speak, you know, for myself in my own experience, that a lot of... Um, the shame that goes with needing help has been, I think, like, it's like it's handed down from generation Mm -hmm. to generation because you're kind of taught, you know, and maybe it's, you know, in my experience, you're taught that, you know, needing help, you're you're weak, Mm -hmm. um, you're not good enough, you're not doing enough, you're, you know, and and growing up for myself, um, like, we always had food in our our bellies. Um, But then, you know, we always, we never did without, um, but I know now as an adult that my mother went, went out quite frequently to, to provide for us. And I experienced those experiences myself. And I feel like the same thing, I had having to go to a food bank, I, I had experienced an experience myself where I was providing food for my son at the time. And I had enough to get him through the week. I had enough for him to have school. He was completely full-bellied for school. Um, but for myself, I was living on soda crackers for mm-hmm. like two good 
good two full weeks. Wow. And because I could not bring myself to go to the food bank to accept and admit, like, I need help. There was a shame involved. And there's so much involved because not only is it the shame of trying to just make yourself get in there to ask for the help, a lot of people get rejected because, again, the lack of resources available or they can only get so much, so many things. Um, if they aren't deemed, I had one lady come up to me and her experience was she was completely rejected because she was um, in a high risk pregnancy. So she had just come off of work where she was originally paid fairly well. Mm -hmm. And then um, through the jigs of reels, she ended up basically being rejected. So it was it was having that shame built up and finally getting in there to be told, sorry, we can't help you. And it's like, wow, you know, it's like almost like it, um, it uh, justifies your shame. You're like, oh, well, I should never have come in here. I'm not, I don't, I don't belong in here. So where do I get my help? And that's where the thing is. It's not just, you know, who you think is struggling. There's people with two family incomes who, who can't afford to, to live. And like, like when you have a one family household, it's almost outrageous to have a one family household or one income household now, because how, how I, I can't even imagine how people do it. I mean, no. I look around and I see people looking for housing, for example, and I'm going, my gosh, that's outrageously priced. The last time I lived in St. John's, I was paying um, like $800 for a two bedroom basement apartment with like nothing included. And then now it's like that same apartment is easily $1,200 a month. Yeah. It's like in just a couple of years, it's, it's, it's crazy. So I think like when she talked about the shame and having to go in there and feeling that shame, I think a lot of people feel that and a lot of people. So the resources, like we have no resources, but can you imagine everyone that really needed it, that isn't going in to ask for the help, how really, really low the resources are, you know, mm -hmm. right? And the impact there on on physical health, mental health, everything, yeah. everything else, yeah. right? And then you and, and and what that can mean then for the whole family's uh, well being, or in this case, lack of well being over time. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it does. It trickles in time, and it might not be noticeable immediately. You have like a running tap, and it's just dripping. Yeah. But over time, I mean, that tap could fill a bucket, and then all of a sudden, it's like you're pouring over. Everything is coming to head, and what, you're, you're, you're wondering struggling. about school impacts. You're yeah, wondering yeah. about stress, and perhaps yeah. uh, just your own response as a parent sometimes. And yeah. all of this, oh yeah, it 100%. keeps going, and yeah. it comes down to a lack of food. And I think, like as a mom, it's the biggest because you know what? Everyone is their own worst critic in various ways. But the second that you bring children into the mix, it's it's no longer about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So. It just adds that extra, like, I call it mom guilt. You know, you're, you're trying to do this and you put down the, you know, you got applesauce today because you had to put back the fresh apples, which is fine. The kids love it. But you know in your heart that's not what you wanted for your children, yeah. right? And it, you shouldn't have to put down the fresh apples and have to sacrifice that. You know, it's you can, but you shouldn't have to, yeah. right? For me, it's a matter of policy. Yeah. Like every time we talk about problems, the solutions are staring us in the face. Mm -hmm. yeah. She talked about competent farmers and then we don't empower these farmers yeah and then we empower the chain stores we empower those who are rich already if we do have if we give the farmers everything they need they're good enough to to sustain the whole the, the entire community but no we don't we give power to those who don't even need it and these policies are i mean they're messed up yeah. to say the least they're they're just yeah. messed up policies yeah just a little twig in those policies would ensure that everyone has food on, on their table. I mean, not just any food, but good food, mm -hmm. decent food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no. So, yeah, far, right. so there's farming you mentioned. And what do you think around whether it comes to social assistance or the emergency food systems of food banks themselves? What needs to be changed there? Um, so if we do have, first of all, we know that food insecurity is a matter of, it's just a, it's a symptom to something bigger, yeah. right? We're talking about, the issue is poverty. People are not earning enough to be able to sustain themselves. I mean, to sustain every need. So we have to make a choice. People have to make a decision. Okay, I'm going to go for a cheaper house so I have a little more money so I can feed my kids. Or And at the end of the day, almost, almost in every case, people tend to cut on food. Because hmm. you're thinking, okay, I could eat a little less yeah. ideal food, less than ideal food and maybe pay the rent or maybe I want to live in this location because my kids need to go to this school or because they're comfortable with this school even when the crunch sets in and you feel like okay I can't afford this anymore so where do we cut 
So then it comes to food. So food insecurity is if we, I feel like we don't even need food banks. Yeah. If we have proper policies in place, we don't need all of these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to go off what you're saying there, when I came to Canada, I remember I didn't have cable TV, nothing. So public broadcast and whatever I could see, like people watching when I walk through the community and having that cross-cultural dynamic where my mother is white Canadian, my father is dark West Indian. And it was just like, I was preached to we're coming to Canada for a better life. And I didn't know what that meant at five years old. But I do remember Zeller's lowest price is the law. Yeah. I didn't realize it was a slogan. But now that I'm older and I'm like, why isn't it a law to have lower prices? Sure. And when I worked at uh, No Frills when I was 17 in Ontario, every day they're up on the ladder changing little figures for the prices of like milk, flour, uh, butter, and a few other staples like bananas, because there was actually a competition to have mm. the lowest price to bring in the customers. Right. So I'm like, when did that disappear? It's right around the time I think we started paying for the plastic bags. Mm. But it's just like, what happened to that culture of the competition? What happened to the culture of, you know, satisfying the customer to have some sort of incentive to come in? And that, I don't know if that's a grocery policy, if that's like a political policy, but it's just like that died. And I'm wondering... Does anybody remember, or is it just me? Oh, Haley, yeah. I think you know, yeah. there's. To I mean, there's there's a whole other show we can do when it talks to when you look at Canada and grocery stores and competition or the lack of competition and prices. Because it doesn't take every second day. There's the, you you look at stories from some of the big grocery store chains. Uh, you know, uh, in in the news, whether it's about the the fifty percent stickers, or I think there's a new one coming in about uh, it's like you buy two, you get a deal, and then or or not. Anyways, there's always stuff Stuff. And there's the whole petition from one of them a little while ago too, right? For law laws, uh, you know, across the country for yeah. folks. Uh, yeah. So this is in this is a big part of the conversation. It's a, it's a really interesting point, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, Earlier this morning, this earlier today, this morning, I uh, spoke with another league member, and it's uh, Amanda Canning. So I've got uh, Amanda on tape. It's about, I think it's six minutes of tape, roughly. So Amanda was in Deer Lake, was going to be on the show live, but had to go to work. <laughs> so I was like, no problem, let's have the chat. So let's have a listen to this, and then I'll just see what you all uh, think about it. Hi, Amanda, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Tell tell us a bit about yourself, just like where you live, and a, and a bit about your family, if you could. I currently live in Deer Lake. Uh, I've been here for seven years in June. I'm originally from Northern Peninsula, uh, but I'm very much enjoying being on the West Coast and all the nice weather and <laughs> being kind of central to Newfoundland, so just everything's not that far away. Uh, I live here with my family. I have uh, five kids, uh, three who are graduated, and one graduates next year, and one going to ninth grade. Uh, I have two stepkids. One lives in Fort Mac, one seven. I'm getting married in five weeks, <laughs> so that's very exciting. Um, and I currently work at the pharmacy here in town as a pharmacy assistant. And I've, it's, it's a new role, so it's very new and fresh, and it's been very good. No complaints. It's a, I have great um, peers to work with, so um, I'm very fortunate in that way. Well, there's a lot of congrats in there, uh, <laughs> right? from, from the job to the, the kids who graduated to the getting married. Congrats, congrats, congrats. Uh, Thank you. And we're just finishing renovations, so I'm, that's the most thing I'm excited about because it's been it's been a labor of love since, like, uh, been 10 months now, so. Amazing. What, yeah. what got you interested in being part of the league? Uh, definitely the aspect of having a voice. And just having communication with other people about uh, topics and concerns of like, you know, what I mean, like, cause I feel like we're all general public. We don't hold any certain position. Mm. So there's no, um, there's no reason other than just us wanting to have conversations and be genuine. There's no side hustle to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's no intent it was just I want to have conversations with other women about what we're all dealing with and struggling with living in Newfoundland and Labrador and what the current climate is for the way life costs right now. <laughs> so what's that like 
what's that been like for you and your family for that current climate and what, and what, what you're struggling with? Uh, it's definitely had its challenges. That's for sure. Uh, I find like myself as same with like friends, family, grandparents, the cost of living is really expensive right now. Um, like just groceries and just gas to get you to and from the places you need to be. And then when you have children, obviously you mean there's expenses to that because you obviously you need more food and more nutritious food and you, well, you want good food for yourself and it's very challenging. Look, we live on an Island, so it's one (laughs) getting good resources, but two, it's like outrageously priced like for a cart and a strawberry. Sometimes you mean for, uh, for my family, I would need two and that would be a snack. Mm. That's like $12 for a snack. That's not even a meal. That's just like five minutes gone. So, I know that I struggle with that and find alternatives and smart ways to shop and you shop the deals. And sometimes you have to leave your community to go shopping to get better deals. And so you're traveling 30 to 40 minutes to go to another community so you can find alternatives to the pricing system that we have in our community. Hmm. And when it comes to lived experience, right, lived and living experience, which is what the group is all about, what other parts have you talked about from your life that has impacted you and and your family for for trying to meet the cost of living and the the growing cost of living? Uh, Well, I came from a single family household, uh, as did my mother. So there was always natural challenges to living in general from a single family. financial household um but i felt like it was more manageable in a sense like things were obviously still priced a certain way but it seemed like we could manage okay because there, it just it seemed like everyone was kind of in a situation and you have you mean like other middle class and all that but it felt like things were okay but then like as time got further on and as we are right now it just seems like the cost of living is just risen a lot not just food but just like in a in a rental situation like i know when i was renting and when i was in my 20s is completely different than when i was renting in my later 30s like the price for rent has doubled and we currently own our home which has been cheaper than actually renting So my genuine concern is I have now three adult children who are going to school and working and having to uh, have rentals. And it's like anywhere from $1,000 to $1,800 a month. And they're children. (laughs) like They were just kids. And now they're going out into the world. And the price to live is double to triple than what I was facing when I was their age. Mm. So the pressure to succeed and do okay is increased like a lot. Last question for you. I mean, those are, are great points. I know your time is limited, but uh, wh- when's the wedding day, by the way? August 3rd. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming on the show to share your, your details, your family details, your thoughts around uh, the cost of living, and congrats uh, on August 3rd. Thank you so much. That was Amanda Canning uh, earlier today. This morning, uh, we just had a chat. Amanda is in uh, in Deer Lake. You were listening to The Signal. I'm Adam Walsh. Today, we are talking about food insecurity in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, if you have thoughts for us, right, how that the high cost of living is impacting you and your family, the signal at cbc.ca for emails. The signal line is 709-576-5260 uh, for messages, or you can text us, 709-327-8206. Here with me in studio, we've got folks from Food First NL's Lived and or Living Experience Advisory Group. Uh, LEAGUE is the acronym. Kayla Dillon, Sada Usman, and Haley Pudan. Thoughts about what you were just hearing there? Uh, it, like, I'm just, just looking over what Amanda was saying, right? Gas to and from places, uh, expenses, challenging living on an island, 30 minute, four to 40 minutes going to a community, rent doubled, worried about her kids, right? Three adult children going to have to rent and 
And again, folks, if you're listening to this show, if you're paying attention at all to the news, you'll know about the housing crisis, the shortage of houses, the need to build thousands of houses to meet up with demand in Newfoundland and Labrador. That's across the country, too, as prices continue to go up. Thoughts? (laughs) Yes, Again, I'm going to go back to policies. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I have yeah. massive, massive issues with policies. So she she mentioned about um, like a one-income household. Yeah. If you're lucky to live on a one-income household, thank God I like moving here. I'm lucky to be able where it, our family is able to, to live on one income because it was okay. Mm. But then there's a lot of newcomers who cannot, who can't speak for the same fact. Yeah, mm-hmm. who come here and there's only an opportunity for one person to work and that income is not even significant enough for, for anything and then we have issue of child care so if you are a mom or a dad then you have to decide well one of us has to go to work because the other has to stay home and take care of the kids and then the money is not even the income is not significant enough to sustain even two incomes in some cases it's not good enough to sustain a household but then you're forced to choose between, well, one of us has to, has to work. And then we do not have child care because you would be on the wait list forever. Yeah. So isn't it like the matter of policy again? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I was chatting to someone. I'm like, I feel like New, Newfoundlanders are not doing something right. Newfoundland and Labrador, like we're missing something. Mm-hmm. If there is a crisis... There should be the crisis is the solution. Look at the crisis and then create a solution around it. Yeah. There is child care crisis. Why not a solution to child care? If I have, if I could, I would do, um, I will build a, a care home or a child, uh, what's the name? Like daycare? So, like a daycare, <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. I would build a daycare and she's like, no, the money is not significant enough. Mm-hmm. Like the stress involved, there is no money in, in daycares. Mm. So, I mean, why do we have policies that just keeps putting the crunch on people? And folks will say that there have been, if you talk to the government, they'll say there's been investments, but things take time. But then this, I think, is to your point as well. It's about the amount of the investment, right? The amount of money that's being spent. So if there's, you're going down to, you're lowering the price for $5 a day daycare or whatever it is, but then you look, oh, there's not enough early childhood educators. Well, then why not? Where's the inv- and then, so then that starts to move. But then you still look at the fact of like the number of spaces and there's the, uh, the, the, the I guess the cost of living for the ECEs and how much mm-hmm. pay they get benefits and these questions around like if you're going to look at them as as a profession as opposed to like what some people will call babysitters which is not correct right yeah, obviously exactly. so like yeah. it, the, the complicated parts of it but like as you're saying it comes down to the amount of the the money being spent by the government exactly that's and that's, right. yeah. that's the problem is because whether directly or indirectly from the government, the the onus of blame is always on the person. So for me as a political science student, that's one thing I started to notice and I started to become a little more conspiracy theory oriented or open to it just because, yes, it costs money to do these things and yes, but us individual people can't do it unless we like crowd crowdfund and, and work together like a, like a village. Mm-hmm. And it's just weird because we're not necessarily organized for that. We're not necessarily equipped to even do that ourselves. So the, the government and the ways of living, cost of living, it's pretty much just making us think it's an us problem mm-hmm. and de, um, like giving us stigma so that way we stay in our problem. And then all of us are having this problem. Mm-hmm. And then we're all butting heads with each other because of this problem. So it's just we need an organized way to make a movement. And as a collective, we can achieve something. And that's kind of what I believe League is doing and other organizations are doing and nonprofits and volunteer positions. But it's just it's not just a you thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take away the stigma. It's not just a you thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that point. Yeah. And I got to say, like, you're saying it takes a village, and it does. And I feel like uh, the villages are all, everyone's so, everyone is so isolated and afraid, afraid to talk, afraid to ask. You don't, some people don't even know their neighbors anymore. Like, it's, there's such a disconnect with everyone. Mm. And I think that that's one of the biggest issues is that everyone is so disconnected. No one knows who to turn to. No one knows who they turn to. No one, everyone's afraid to tell somebody something because if I say to my neighbor that I'm struggling now, uh, what's going to happen next? Like uh, now I'm feeling shame because someone knows my secrets or, you know, it seems like and maybe it's electronics, maybe it's the internet world, maybe it's my age saying that, I don't know. But, <laughs> but you know, like, everything is so simple now that mm. everyone's at your fingertips that you're not connected with anybody anymore. You just see them. 
Yeah. You're on Facebook. You see them. You see them on Facebook, and that's it. But there's no connection, and that's where a lot of the disconnect. You know, a lot of the the communities that are struggling. They. I, that's my thing. I think you need to bring back the togetherness and the stigma against you know people on income support. You know, the middle class, and you know we need to kind of bring all these together because you know you'll have people speaking of stigma. You'll have people blaming you know people on income support and then you'll have other people blaming the middle class and everyone's blaming each other and That's the reality community. is it's none of us yeah. it's it's not us at all it's it's the people out there in their in their big suits completely disconnected from the people that they're managing you know and mm. and it's like they don't even get it you don't get it that's why a league is here because because yeah. they don't get it but we get it so that's why we're here to to share that because people are in their own world struggling suffering feeling alone and everyone around them is is the same we're all the same right we're yeah. all struggling in some way but we're all feeling that crunch yes right? i i agree 100 and the silo system of living that we are in right now is like the main problem if we have a community if you have a neighbor who's hungry like and adam you can tell or you can speak for that i'm sure like you've mm -hmm. experienced other cultures yeah. right especially in asia food is a unifier food is what brings us together Mm -hmm. So if you have a neighbor who's hungry, maybe you have a potluck, um, potluck style dinner and everybody brings something and mm -hmm. that neighbor doesn't show up or maybe he didn't he didn't bring enough. Then you know that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I know this is not like a permanent solution, no. but this would ensure that somebody doesn't go to bed hungry. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there is also a little bit of a, a we problem. Yeah. Like we also need to do our due diligence. We also need to bring back community. Yeah. We also need to look out for each other. Everyone yeah. is just, you know, yeah. comfortable. Can, I'm, I'm happy in my own home. So, mm. yeah. you know, and like we say in league, like it's not a matter of when. Um, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah. Because sometimes you have people who are international students, they move abroad. And being students, you don't have all the money. Well, some people do, but only a very tiny small, fraction small of... Small group. Yes. Which is why you have all of you together, right? And then when we have the mm -hmm. voice from, like, Amanda Canning earlier, Elizabeth Saunders, and, and you folks here today, mm -hmm. then you keep talking about it, and through lived and yeah. or living experience, that can ho help inform policy. Because when people hear, hopefully there's some empathy there, and then policy yeah. can change. Amanda Gear popped in the studio for a second, because I want to do a quick reminder, because we're just about out of time. Talk to me about Beef Stew for a second, uh, two of you, because uh, th this is up. It's been up. It was on here now last night. It did the rounds of social media. But uh, if folks missed it, Amanda, talk to me about it. Well, Kayla and I, Kayla Dillon, who's here in the studio, made a pot of beef stew together um, as a result of reading the Vital Signs Report from the Harris Center. Uh, the cost of a pot of beef stew in the last five years has risen by 43%, which is astounding because it's a simple meal, a staple meal for most families. Yeah. So we put that to the test. Yeah. Um, we went out and got our groceries at Holloway's Value Grocer in Lethbridge. Um, they were wonderful. Paul is just a gem. Their prices are very reasonable. At Bloomfield. <laughs> <laughs> the argument of where the grocery store is. It's in Bloomfield. It's in Bloomfield. <laughs> <laughs> We've been there. <laughs> so we picked up our groceries, and although the... The prices are very reasonable and comparable to the bigger stores here in the city. Uh, we paid fifty-seven dollars for you had to buy everything you needed. Yeah, yeah, for that pot of stew. Mm -hmm. um, however, the stew was wonderful, Most but okay. we realized through our conversations and making this stew what an issue this is—not just for affordability, but for accessibility to buy these groceries. And many of these small grocers are the lifeline for the community. Yeah, right. So As what we've talked about today? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right, like about distance and, and accessibility on a number of levels for, for where the food is in Newfoundland mm -hmm. and, and Labrador. We only have like 20 seconds. Uh, Kayla, just final final thought from you on this? Yeah, it was, uh, accessibility is huge. And that was one thing we found, um, like uh, Holloway's, for example, they do like a credit system for a lot of their older seniors. And, and you just kind of hear it along the way when you go in there uh, and getting to it, like there's no taxi services and things like that. There's so many barriers to get the food. And, and uh, I was so grateful for you guys to come out and, and do that with you because it was humbling for me to even have that experience right so if you have not seen this video 
Uh, there's a couple ways. You can you just Google, Google, I can't even say it right, Google it's doing the cost of living, right? Uh, and put in like Amanda Gear or Kayla Dillon. Or you can go to a CBC Newfoundland and Labrador's YouTube page, and the signal has a playlist. That video is there. This show will be there. Do not uh, do not miss this uh, future shows. Catch this show later if you want to watch it again or watch it for the first time and listen to it again. Uh, tomorrow's Trivia Day with John Gushu. He'll be in. It's an easy Friday summer show for us all. But thank you for listening today. Thank Thank you for all of you here in studio. I really appreciate your time and uh, input. We'll catch you later, folks.